Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Dan Rundy. I'm a senior vice president at CSIS and I hold the Schreier Chair in Global Analysis. We're here this morning for a conversation on digital technologies and the post-pandemic development challenge. COVID-19 is undoubtedly disrupting traditional institutions and economic markets. Not only has it disrupted supply chains and slowed down global economic growth, but it has also exposed and exacerbated the digital divide. For instance, less than one fifth, 18% of households in Africa currently has broadband access, a challenge that worsens in lower income and rural communities, making digital adaptation for such communities harder in pandemic times. Furthermore, small businesses, which make up substantial parts of developing economies have been some of the hardest hit sectors and are at risk of remaining held back. But despite, but despite facing such an acute crisis, emerging markets have a significant opportunity to fast track their development goals by successfully adopting new and emerging digital technologies. In part, countries have tested their ability to pursue digital transformation by prioritizing financial services, judicial systems, and the education sector. Because of this, policymakers in developing countries now have a substantial momentum to partner with the private sector, with private sector actors to pursue digital transformation of the wider economy and leapfrog their way to achieve the sustainable development goals. To impact this further, CSIS is really happy to be convening a diverse panel of experts to discuss in detail how developing countries can drive an ambitious, competitive, and comprehensive digital transformation to achieve their development goals in the post-pandemic world. I'm really grateful that Karan Bhatia, who is currently head of global government affairs and public policy at Google is with us today. today. Um, he leads Google's work with policymakers, government officials, and key pol uh, political stakeholders. He had a really interesting and great career in government as well. We also have Dr. Ottaviano Canuto, who's a non-resident senior fellow in global economy at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he's a well-respected researcher, but he also, his experience includes 15 years as vice president, executive director, or senior advisor at the World Bank, the IMF, and the IDB. It's gonna be great. We're really pleased to have Dr. Canuto with us. And finally, I'm really quite happy to have Dr. Sharice Dunn from South Africa who is the co-founder and CEO, COO of South Africa Makes, where she executes regional digital manufacturing strategic goals, overseeing operation and, and enhancing the company brand with key partnerships with local and international stakeholders. She's a global thought leader on 3D printing for development, 3D for D, and believes that this fourth industrial revolution technology will drive the future competitiveness of Africa and the global economy. So we have three really great speakers. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm gonna start first with Karan, if I might. Karan, thanks for being here. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how Google is thinking about the development challenges confronting emerging markets and the role of digital technologies in confronting those challenges, please? Thanks for being here. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it's good to see you, and thanks to CSIS for for putting on this this panel. I think it's an important topic, and it's great to be on with uh, my fellow panelists. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I think the last year has been just an extraordinarily challenging one for everyone, uh, for all the world's economies, but particularly for the emerging markets and for the developing world. And you know, it, it, for for a lot of reasons, from our vantage point, we've seen COVID make it difficult uh, for them to make progress on on economic development goals. It's been, you know, attacks on fiscal resources. It's clearly exacerbated unemployment. We've seen deepened inequalities, as you referenced. Um, but the other thing that we've seen in this period that is that it has really shown a light on the role that technology plays and can play 
in, in, in dealing with and helping us overcome the kinds of challenges that we've seen in the pandemic. I mean, just look at how we all have adjusted our lives with, with online commerce, with, uh, you know, with, with remote education, with video conference meetings like this. Um, so, uh, you know, as we look at it, there is a lot of evidence anecdotal and otherwise, the digital connectivity has really been one of the key drivers of how well businesses have survived uh, or, or not, and, and how well countries have fared. And we just don't think that's going away. Uh, you know, we think that the digital strategies are going to be more critical than ever. And the degree of adoption, you know, of, of sound strategies technology strategies, digital strategies by emerging markets and developing countries are going to be a, a greater than ever determinant of economic success going forward. Um, I'd say the good news here is that there's just so much potential. Um, and I'd cite you and, and everyone to a study that we recently produced um, in partnership with a consulting firm, Alpha Beta, that, that highlights how much potential there is uh, for economic growth if we saw emerging markets and developing the developing world um, really lean into and prioritize the digital economy. And what we basically did, what they, they did is they looked at sort of the share of the digital economy in those markets to date and and compare, you know, thought if we could if we could bring it up to something roughly comparable to what we'd see elsewhere, you know, the results were something along the lines of three and a half trillion dollars in terms of incremental uh, GDP and and places like Africa. They just focused on 16 countries. But, you know, you look at places like Nigeria, 175 billion, South Africa, 116 billion. So there's there's just it has been an incredibly challenging period. Uh, a lot of learnings, some fundamental changes have happened that we don't think are reversible and shouldn't be reversed, and but also incredible opportunities if we lean into this going forward. Good. Ottaviano, thanks for being here. In my mind, in the last 54 weeks, there's been more e-commerce, e-government, distance learning and the use of digital payments than in the last 54 years, not just in the United States, but in the entire world and including the developing world. So what are your thoughts, Ottaviano, about uh, the pandemic driven digital divide that's you know been kind of made clearer, digital technologies potential to address them and the push for countries to leapfrog uh, the, the, their uh, development goals as well as reaching, you know, and, cl and closing this digital divide. So thanks, Ottaviano, for being here. Uh, my pleasure, Daniel, and, and thanks for having me here. Uh, look, Karen said it quite well. Uh, we have both uh, uh, challenge and uh, an opportunity on the on the perspective of uh, the uh, emerging markets and development economies, because the digital gap is there, and and COVID nineteen has accentuated. I like to say that uh, the COVID nineteen is not changing history, but it's accelerating uh, history, particularly in the case of the reliance on digital solutions, and. Uh, uh, and because as we know, some of the uh, adaptations that have taken place to cope with the pandemic everywhere will not be fully reversed. The point now, the, the challenge is that uh, things have to happen uh, in at least four major areas for the emerging markets and development economies to exercise the, uh, the, 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 the to use the, the opportunities. We'll have to have uh, a push on the investments on physical capital, that is to say the connectivity in the digital infrastructure. We will have to have as well uh, investments in human capital because uh, you know the need for uh, worker training, job security, uh, the space for entrepreneurship uh, will have to be more than ever uh, focused on in emerging markets and development economies. We'll have to have 
uh, initiatives that uh, are helpful to proliferate digital data, the uh, use of artificial intelligence, and we also we'll need to have uh, a system, an ecosystem that is friendly to competitiveness. The reason I'm highlighting those, and, uh, and they were well uh, well said in a recent report by, by from Google, is the fact that all the successful experience that we have seen in the last decades uh, of, uh, of uh, emerging markets and, or developing economies uh, coming from behind and managing to to join the ranking of, uh, of countries uh, innovating and so on, uh, they all combined the use of technology available from outside to globalization with domestic efforts to create the complementary domestic uh, uh, features that incentivize the investment by local agents on the creation of capabilities. And that applies more than, uh, than, than ever in the case of uh, the digital economy. So we have to have a counterpart on uh, the level of the countries in terms of policies, so as to reap the fruits uh, made available by the, uh, the, in the intensified digital economy. And the gains are so, so broad. Uh, it comes to mind, for instance, how finance uh, can uh, uh, leap leapfrog uh, and, and move ahead as we have seen in some experiments in Africa and so on. Thank you. Fabulous, that makes a ton of sense to me, your four points about physical capital, human capital, having a system to kind of enable and manage digital data, it's great. And then I think also sort of a system to enable competitiveness, I think implies a little bit to allow for new innovations to emerge too. Right. I mean, I think that's we, we don't know what the future holds. I mean, I think if we'd been talking about 3D printing 15 years ago, we couldn't have imagined talking about 3D for D, which, you know, for example, or some of the issues around data that we're having to deal with as societies. Uh, Sharice Dunn, thanks for being here. I am so envious that you live in Cape Town and you have one of the coolest Hi, jobs. Dan. You have one of the coolest jobs in the world, too. You're, you're working on 3D printing for development. You've come at this fast, you know, I, we did a report at CSIS in, with the help of the Japanese aid agency, JICA, probably five or six years ago, looking at the potential for 3D printing in developing countries. And I think it was a little early. You're obviously someone who's now kind of taken this idea and are bringing sort of the fourth industrial revolution to Africa. And I just think you're, it, it's real. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing and tell us about how you think fourth industrial revolution technologies are gonna transform Africa, it's very exciting. Thank you so much, Dan, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about what, what, what we do here in Cape Town, um, South Africa Mix is a medical device manufacturing company. We are internationally recognized and an award-winning company implementing the inclusive digital manufacturing of affordable and sustainable healthcare solutions, which currently includes in vitro diagnostic medical devices for COVID-19. Um, to my knowledge, the first of its kind company on the continent. We also support various research and development in healthcare sectors in Southern Africa, offering prototyping, design and digital manufacturing of custom solutions for their specific needs. And for those who may be watching and may not be aware of it, 3D printing or um, also known as additive manufacturing is one of the main emerging technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. Having gained a lot of prominence and received a lot of attention throughout the pandemic with countries having global supply chain challenges, which we've seen. Um, so 3D printing for, de for development, like you mentioned, it has been posited as the ideal strategy to empower emerging economies with innovative and sustainable technology to effectively respond to localized healthcare challenges. Um, it talks to the sustainable manufacturing methods, local job creation and reduced carbon, um, carbon emissions as a result of the reduced need to transport goods globally. So as a company, we are passionate about amplifying the environmental, social and governance impacts of 3D printing for development in Africa. And if anyone's interested, you can learn more about this on my TEDx talk. Uh, yeah, so we're a young, innovative company pioneering the adoption of this technology at scale. And we are working to grow not only our business, but the broader opportunity for these sustainable circular solutions. And from our perspective, this refers primarily to digital manufacturing solutions in emerging economies. 
to, to have 3D printing, and this is, I'm, I'm speaking kind of in kind of simplistic terms, it seemed to me that when I looked at this several years ago, you needed, there's certain kinds of basic materials you need to bring in to be able to kind of make 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 the stuff various things that you know sort of more higher value act you know so there there implies certain kinds of basic inputs it probably yes. requires a certain amount of electricity and sort of internet connectivity for it for those sorts of things to happen but it also probably implies and this was a little bit to aviano taviano's point about human capital there's certain kinds of a high a, a certain level of human capital could you talk a little bit about sort of how you make that all happen Sure. Well, if, if I can, if I'll try and be brief, but it, it's, it's, it's been a challenge in terms of finding the right kind of combination in terms of human capital. We've been working on this for a number of years in developing the capacity locally to be able to um, fully engage in this um, established industry that's, that's well established globally. So we really rely on our international partnerships to assist us in moving some of our key um, projects forward. And like you say, it, it obviously also relies on various forms of infrastructure that we've had to, um, as I mentioned, rely and build on international collaborative efforts that have helped us to really cement and grow the foundation that we've been able to to work on and um, move move the development and the adoption of this technology here. Okay, good. I, I, I do think, you know, it seems to me uh, that for all for all three of you, I mean, I, I think we've all been sitting in our basements on Zoom. What I've been saying is the bad news is we are all sitting in our basements on Zoom, but perhaps the good news is that we're all sitting in our basements on Zoom. So we can do things like this that has some, you can do, you know, there, that, that there's some good things about this kind of a digital presence that works. I do think it, it helps if you have some kind of personal previous relationship, you've got some kind of social capital, or if you're just starting out professionally, it's probably really hard. It's hard to mentor, it's hard to create social capital or trust. Um, so that I still believe that there's a, a great need for in-person connectivity. And I would argue that to some extent, mo many of us, our social capital or our networks are kind of whatever they were on March the 12th of 2020. Now, maybe we've made, I, I, I you know, I, I, you know, if I come to Cape Town, I'm going to, um, you know, I'll, uh, I'm hoping to have coffee with, with Sharice Dunn and her team at, at some point. So, I mean, I think, you know, I, you, you can create new additional connectivity, but it's, it's more limited. So I just think, um, that's that's one thing I've taken away from sort of my my thousand Zoom calls since March the 12th is sort of the social capital phenomenon. But a second thing is this digital transformation. We are being digitally transformed, whether we like it or not. As I said earlier, in the last 54 weeks, there's been more digital payments, dig e-commerce, e-government and distance learning than in the last 54 years. So this digital transformation is coming right now. So I think this conversation is very relevant. This is not a theoretical conversation. We are being collectively digitally transformed. I think the three of you have talked about this. Could I ask each of you to talk about the issue of what the, we, we have the spring meetings coming up. So you have the World Bank and the IMF annual meetings, which is a, you know, it's di it being hosted digitally. Could you talk a little bit, each of you, a little bit what you all think is a role for the multilateral development banks and other development institutions? I'm thinking about USAID, I'm thinking about Japan, I'm thinking about the develop the alphabet soup of development finance institutions. The, in the US it's called the DFC, but there's a whole alphabet soup of these folks. There's the IFC and the as part of the World Bank, there's FMO and CDC and a whole bunch of others. Let me start with you, Ottaviano, to kind of answer that question, but I'd love Sharice and Karan to each answer that question as well. Like what's the role of the aid agencies and kind of making all this happen? Because this, this digital transformation that we're experiencing, this is gonna get closed. In the next 10 years, the digital divide is gonna get closed and it could be closed in a way that's, you know, helps everybody and allows for innovation or it could get closed in a way that's probably less friendly to innovation and less friendly to kind of, uh, you know, and making sure that it's done in a way that that is broad based to make sure everyone's brought along. But let me start with you, Ottaviano, then maybe Sharice and then Karan. All right. And, uh, uh... Sure, Daniel. Uh, look, uh, obviously this week, the focus will mostly uh, be on the uh, fiscal and, and monetary uh, policies adopted by countries uh, to flatten the recession curves in, the, in all the countries and so on. So this is going to be the focus. But there's something quite important that the multilateral institutions 
can play in with regard to, to our discussion here. There has been in recent years, a move uh, uh, in those institutions, particularly in the case of IFC, but also World Bank as a whole, and the other multilateral development banks are also following the steps towards uh, using the resource, the scarce resource of these institutions to crowd in private investments in, in developing countries rather than simply substitute for them, rather than crowding out. This is quite important because, well, the size of these institutions, uh, of, of their levels of operations has shrunk over time. And it's good that we have another uh, attitude now uh, in the case of the major shareholders, which may uh, allow for some sort of a, uh, capital replenishment in the future of these institutions, but they can play an important role in, for instance, uh, dealing, uh, covering some risks, some type of risks that the private sector doesn't feel comfortable in coping with. And by that way, the multilateral institutions, let's say, instead of financing uh, uh, a 5G uh, uh, infrastructure, they, they could, they can uh, provide insurance ag against some types of risks and that allow that gives the ground for uh, uh, in institutional investors and so on to step in and, and complement the, the whole thing. I guess this move towards towards the, the uh, complementarity of, of the investment by these uh, by those banks vis-a-vis -vis the private sector will certainly be the way forward is what I, uh, I have called in my writings, matchmaking of finance and infrastructure. That's an important role that the, 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 those multilateral institutions uh, can provide to, to the countries. Okay, Cherie, so you're in South Africa. If you were having a conversation with the president of the World Bank or the president of the African Development Bank or uh, Mr. Dupe, who's the new head of the IFC, what, from where you sit in terms of 3D printing or the fourth industrial revolution, what is the role mm -hmm. of institutions in helping make this digital transformation? How do we how do we leverage these institutions to accelerate some of the things that Taviana was talking about? And also from where you sit. Thanks, Dan. What an opportunity that would be. Um, but honestly, multilateral institutions can really have such a positive effect in addressing some of these challenges that we're talking about today. Uh, for example, um, instead of donating funds perhaps to governments for local initiatives, my suggestion would be to redirect those, um, those global funds to directly support more public private sector initiatives. And this to me would encourage more collaborative efforts across the board and to assist developing countries to foster, I think, acceptance and adoption of technologies in various sectors of their economies. And one of the most important things that multilateral institutions could do is to acknowledge the significant negative effect that the pandemic has had on vulnerable and the most marginalized population groups around the world. And this includes women and people of color from developing countries. So if we focus just on the effects on women, um, a recent article uh, that I read from The Economist had revealed that the pandemic was historically bad for working class women, not only in the, in the United States, but this is supported by numerous reports um, from organizations like UN Women that have highlighted similar facts about how COVID-19 is rolling back women's economic gains in past decades unless we act deliberately. So the majority female services sector, um, sector has lost their jobs at a much faster rate than the majority male goods producing sector, which has never happened before in a recession. And there's been many, um, many reports that have shown just how women are more vulnerable to COVID-19 related economic effects because of existing gender inequalities. So there's a lot that can be done to change and improve this. And I think the message from me is that the foster policymakers and business leaders can act to push for greater gender equality in digital transformation initiatives. Even as the COVID-19 crisis continues, the bigger the benefits would be, not just for improving gender equality, but also for economic growth in those, in those countries. Great. Now, Sharice, I, I, I agree. I completely agree. I do think there's going to be 
a lot of pressure from countries to help close the digital divide. I just think this is one of the big takeaways from COVID is if we're all doing this on Zoom, uh, students, African students in, in public in K through 12, but also in higher education are also on Zoom. They've been doing distance learning. We've seen yeah. huge shifts in e-commerce, huge shifts in digital government. So publics all over the world are demanding the, the, the closing of this digital divide. So some of this, the MDBs can do in terms of probably enabling some of the, the, hard, the hard infrastructure and some of the policy stuff that's required, but the kinds of actually enabling innovators and doers like you is also such a key thing. So I certainly could see the DFIs doing this, the IFCs of the world investing in organizations like yours, but I could also see organizations like USAID or JICA, which are sort of more bilateral and perhaps more willing to use grant money and take you know, risks to kind of use risk, kind of grant money as the ultimate form of risk capital to partner, sometimes blended, sometimes not, sometimes just as a grant, sometimes as sort of as part of a blended impact investment or as a, you know, enabling a full profit investment because these are huge opportunities that Karan was talking about in terms of sort of the huge business opportunities, I'm sure. Um, so it sounds to me like, you know, there's, there's a lot to be done by the MDBs and the DFIs and the traditional aid agencies to work with, with folks like you. I would hope so. I would hope so. I think we've we've spoken for a number of years with um, allies from around the world who have believed in what we do and have seen seen the benefits in their own countries. Uh, we work very closely with the U.S. State Department in the public diplomacy programs, and that really helped us, I think, gain some solid foundation and momentum here. In, in terms of helping helping women, girls, communities understand what 3D printing is all about. And um, more importantly, the economic benefits of being involved with not only this kind of technology, but other fourth industrial revolution technologies. But you're right, it, it takes, it really ta it ultimately takes a village of global partners, allies, um, on the ground, local um, established partners to be getting together and putting, having, um, having discussions around what are effective ways to get these types of initiatives going where people see real impact because that's important. Can I just say, I'm really proud of my government and I'm really proud of the State Department. I would give them a shout out for the embassy having the perspicacity to recognize that you are a real serious innovator and having you join as an international visitor, as part of the International Visitor Leadership Program, which is a very prestigious, not well known in Washington. It's known outside of the United States, but not as well known as it should be in the United States and in Washington of our premier cultural program, identifying great, you know, high potentials and, and already achieving, you know, high achievers and stars like you to come to the United States. So I'm really proud of my government for for, for finding you. So kudos to the U.S. Embassy in South Africa and kudos to the State Department public diplomacy team for finding you. I'm really happy about that. So I think now I want, now what I want is AID uh, and the DFIs to, to, to partner, find, you know, to have, there's a whole universe and cohort of folks like you in the developing world that we need to have a new, new sort of form of public private partnership with. And so I'm very, and op enthusiastic and have a lot of optimism about that this is going to happen over the next couple of years. So homework assignment for AID, homework assignment for JICA, homework assignment for the DFIs is call Sharice. If they, you want her contact information, call, call me and I'll connect you, guys, you all up, okay? But we need to make this happen. You're the base, Dan. <laughs> So, so, so Karan, we've got this, we've got this, we've got the spring meetings coming up. You've been in government, you're in the private sector, you've worked in at GE, you work, you're now at Google. What is the role of the MDBs? What's the role of aid agencies more broadly, Karan, in sort of ma helping make sure kind of this, you know, the, you've had the study and, and Ottaviano's painted this picture and then Sharice is helping us see what the potential is on the ground. Like, what are the role of the MDBs and the other aid agencies in making this happen from where you sit, Karan? Well, Dan, I thought you were going to pose it the same way you did to the other two, which is what I would say if I were yeah, sitting in front of them. I think, I think the first thing say? I would do is is grab Otaviano and Sharice and have them talk because they've been, they are, they, I, I mean, I, 
both super compelling and thoughtful. And I think a lot of uh, what one would say they they sort of ticked off here. I I guess I would to to sort of step back for a second. I see two things, frankly, for 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 the the, the one is to support investment, the right investment decisions, right? To support the whether it's on the physical capital or the human capital side. And I think Ottaviano sort of very put very nicely uh, the fact that there's going to need to, this is going to increasingly in the world that we are living in with, you know, private sector capital flows. So dwarfing what we're seeing from the NDB side, it's going to need to be done creatively sort of spurring things, creating, you know, laying hands on investments in ways that are going to give the private sector confidence to come in, spotting smart, you know, ways, innovative ways of doing it as Sharice laid out. Um, and then and then paying attention not just to the bricks and mortar or not just to the broadband or the pipelines and or you know subsea cables, but also to to the human resources. You can create all of that if you don't have people who are uh, you know, who have the facility to, 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 to utilize digital technologies, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. So I'd say one thought is spurring the right set of investments. The other really is in some ways what I think the MDB is, um, frankly, if anything, even greater relevance is from a private sector, from a business perspective today, which is helping steer mindsets and thinking. And, and that is both at the government level in the, in the, in the developing markets in particular, and also in the private sector, um, you know, on the developing in the, in the government, uh, side of things, I think, you know, Ottaviano was, was sort of running through the, the four part structure of, uh, recommendations here, which I, I, you know, I think is exactly right. I think in this sort of third space of technological innovation, how do you get a government to sort of stop, pause what it may have been doing for many years, a particular kind of, of, of procurement process, let's say, a particular kind of, of, of uh, educational process and say, no, we're going to look at a new technological, more innovative, more digitally enabled way of doing this. That's hard to do, right? There are so many impediments to governments making hard changes like that. Look at our own government. Look at the U.S. Try to get them to change anything. It's, it's, uh, it, you know, I am more optimistic, honestly, about the emerging markets' ability and willingness to do this. But one thing they have to do is sort of shape government mindset around this so that there is an all of government understanding and embrace of the power of technology to drive development agenda. The second thing I would do, uh, the second mindset change is to the private sector. Challenge us challenge us, right? You know, I mean, there are far too many companies today that whose idea of ser serving or engaging in the emerging markets continues to be, I'll send my, you know, highly expensive, highly engineered piece of whatever, automotive equipment, you know, uh, MRI machines or whatever. And, 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 and let's let, you know, assume that's going to work. No, we need a different mindset. And one of the things I'm so proud of about Google, uh, you know, is, and I'll give you two examples of things that that sort of, I, I, from my vantage point, m make this compelling and sort of have us right. One is name another product where you get the exact same service, whether you are a hedge fund manager sitting in New York or you're the poorest farmer in the poorest sub-Saharan African country. You get the, you type the same query into Google, you get the same results regardless of who you are. And you're doing it for free. You know, there's not a lot of other uh, products around there like that. But the other thing that we've been doing is trying to implement and innovate new apps, for instance, that will allow uh, people where bandwidth is constrained and costly uh, to be able to get the same services at a lower bandwidth. So you can re-engineer apps to use less bandwidth, for instance, sometimes with a little bit less service, but with a, that's the kind of creative thinking that we need to be challenged to do more of, but so does every other company out there. So those would be my, my th thoughts of what I would put on their plate.
Well, let me, this is great. So let me just suggest the following that to have this digital transformation, there's a whole bunch of boring stuff I'm going to describe that are really important, the non shiny widgety stuff. So you need basic education. You need folks who can have human capital. Taviana was talking about this. So you need basic education. You then need a higher level of education, probably not in every technology. You also need to have rules of the game. Ataviana was talking about systems that are friendly to competitiveness. Karan, I think it's probably fair to say that the, tech, the rate of technology, or if I ask Cherise, like the change in the rate of technology change is happening really darn fast. Yep. So we could, we could end up kind of regulating to horse and buggy stuff if we're not careful. I mean, I mean, just from what I was saying to Sharice earlier, Sharice, I did this project on 3D printing in the Philippines with JICA, maybe 2015. I get the sense that, that this technology has moved a lot in six years. So you need to have some rules that enable investment and, you know, or allow for innovation to happen, but also, you know, protects people and, you know, et cetera, also doesn't allow for straight, you know, com, you know it, it, that allows for competitiveness and, and, and change. But also you talked to Karan about things like procurement, like 20 to 25% of the GMP per capita of developing countries goes through the hands of national and subnational government procurement officials. This is really, you know, so, so buying technologies, buying hard, hard. So there's gonna be a whole bunch of hard stuff that goes into the soft, the digital technology is gonna require setting up, you know, like not the equivalent of telephone poles. It's not telephone poles, but you know, like physical things to make this all happen. There's a whole physical backbone to make this all happen. These are all things the MDBs are going to be a part of. So there's a big role for these. But I do think too, as I was listening to Sharice and I was listening to you, Karan and Ottaviano, there's an important role for AID. So a lot of people in Washington, folks from AID and folks who you know are influencers are thinking about this. There's going to be an important role for grant money and partnering and enabling people like Sharice to flourish, a whole cohort of folks like Sharice to flourish. And I think that's a role for AID. I also think some of the things, Karan and Tommy, you were talking about that. So bilateral aid agencies have really important roles in this stuff to make this happen as well. So, so I think there's some important shiny stuff and there's important tech potential, but there's a whole bunch of boring stuff that we still need to do to get to that place. Is that Karan, is that a, is that a fair fair description? I, I absolutely, absolutely, Dan. I mean, I think uh, I think the 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 boring. I mean, your your reference to procurement as boring stuff, I think, is a perfect example of this, right? You know, figuring out how do you expedite e-gov processes? How do you expedite government processes generally to to make them more digitally enabled and savvy? Is a is a profoundly impactful thing that can be done, right? You need, but you do need a mindset shift. You need to accept cloud computing, for instance, you need to, so there are things that you could, you can do here, uh, but it is going to be to some extent unsexy, but impactful. Great. Okay. So let's see here. I've got a couple of other questions um, I wanted to ask you all here. So, okay. So the, Sharice, could you talk about uh, a little bit more about sort of the wh where you see these technologies going? I mean, you're you're I mean, you're an evangelist for 3D for D. What where what's this going to look like at five three to five years from now in Africa? Because I think some folks are going to say 3D printing for Africa. Maybe I could see that in Brazil. Maybe I could see that in Malaysia. Now I think it's an inappropriate and kind of an out of date mental picture. I mean, because I think this is not your grandparents or your parents' Africa. I mean, there's some amazing, there's an entire cohort of amazing uh, social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs like you that are changing mm -hmm. the face of Africa. So talk about, talk about where, where, where some of these technologies are going and what, what, what you think the, the future looks like if, if we got all these things right we've been talking about. I think, I think it's really exciting. I mean, if, you know, my colleagues on the panel have been sharing the insight now, we essentially, we need a, we need a whole bunch of moving parts to, to really get this going, right? And it's, it's a massive challenge, but what, I think we're on our way there and it's incredibly exciting. So the movement is towards rethinking globalization. And I think with the example of the ever given shift in the Suez Canal, um, having highlighted again, the vulnerability of global supply chains and the physical movement of goods, it, 
having globalization be as effective as it used to be or running in the old ways, but it, it's not going to happen. So new technologies have to contribute to this and we need, we all need to be involved with that. So if we think about it with regards to us and the work that we do with 3D printing with certain products, we currently have the IP rights, right, to manufacture medical devices on behalf of companies based elsewhere in the world which is great. But you think around the economic and possible opportunities of expansion of that and scale of that and just other, other things. So we really consider ourselves proponents for this idea of um, digital globalization, where we can make American or Canadian products in Africa with the IP being honed and developed elsewhere in the world and through collaboration and partnerships in some cases where we tweak that IP for African needs, but those projects are based and realized through collaboration and that's how we work. So what's exciting for me is around the sharing of knowledge and moving towards a knowledge knowledge kind of um, economy instead of being really focused on, 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 on old commodities. So in future, the IP may be generated by the same company, may not be um, generated by the same company that created it, like in our case, but the, the partners in the emerging, emerging um, countries are offering things like local employment and skills for the future. And that can look in, that can look so many different ways. And it's really, it's really exciting for us to see where 3D printing has already journeyed and how it's already changed and evolved over a few years with the different types of technologies and the evolution of it and the, the new types of materials and just the, the fascinating things and the real intricate um, solutions that we are now able to offer and custom made solutions for patients and R&D needs um, in Africa right now today. Um, and we never thought that would be possible before. So if we have more people like that connected to this growing ecosystem of these massive supporters and sharers of IP um, and all sorts of resources, we can do absolutely phenomenal things. And I think really quickly to how the development and this quest for COVID-19 vaccines, for example, has obviously been at the forefront of the of news globally. And it's really put technologies like mRNA technology at the forefront of, of people's minds. And a, a few years ago, you wouldn't have believed or you wouldn't really have considered or, or seen the applications of that kind of technology in, in other historically um, important healthcare challenges like HIV and cancer therapies. And now through the opportunity that the pandemic has created with mRNA being given the opportunity to flourish under the certain conditions and the support that it's been given, um, you can now see the, 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 those applications fast forwarded and executed at a much faster pace. So all around the world, I think certain technologies are being given, are now finally being given the opportunity to thrive um, because they now have additional additional support from, I think, leaders um, leaders of industry in in the world, um, like in the United States and in Switzerland and in other places, and it's it's really important that I think emerging countries and leaders within within these within the different countries are able to engage and and learn from each other and hopefully provide emerging other emerging technologies similar kinds of support so that we can see what we can see that potential realized my other takeaway after 600 zoom calls since march the 12 to 2020 is that we're going to see tectonic shifts in global supply chains we're going to see folks thinking about open, opening having different strategies resilient supply chains large country plus one is going to be a strategy. I think there's some net winners. I think Mexico and Central America and the Caribbean could be net winners. I think North America could be a net winner. I think Southeast Asia could be a net winner. Perhaps Africa could be a net winner. And I suspect, I also think you're going to see following that sort of a new geoeconomic and geostrategic push for new regional trading arrangements and trading agreements. And I hope that happens. Um, but I guess one of the questions I want to put to the three of you is we've talked about what's the role and responsibility of MDBs and aid agencies. There's an opportunity, I would argue, for a number of countries, there's a once in a generation opportunity for countries if they have the right sets of policies to attract these, these tectonic shifts in global supply chains. And along with that is going to be sort of this, some of these digital changes we've been talking about. So could you talk from each of your perspectives about what is the role of policymakers in helping enable, um, you know, to take advantage of some of these you know, disruptions that create opportunities in them. Let me start with you, Karan. Like what, from where from where you sit, 
how should policymakers, and you talked a little bit about this a, a little bit in terms of, as you're describing the report, but just what, what are some of the roles that policymakers, national government policymakers and subnational government policymakers need to be thinking about to take advantage of kind of this, these, these changes that are happening? Yeah, I mean, Dan, really, it is, it is uh, such a critical element, uh, you know, having, having uh, the right set of policies in practice. I mean, we can, we can uh, talk about it, we can have the, uh, you know, we can have the, 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 the MDBs get up on soapboxes, but unless there's actual regulation, unless we're actually seeing policy on the ground, interactions with governments, investments, et cetera, uh, we're not, it's, it's not going to yield the, the results we're looking for. I mean, we've talked about a bunch of these things, you know, obviously having the governments uh, make the right set of investments in their people, uh, not just in terms of digital training, just more generally, you know, gender equity issues, for instance, that we continue to see as being a huge constraint on growth uh, in a lot of the emerging markets. Um, the right set of technological uh, sort of the, the right mindset and and set of policies with respect to technology and innovation. Uh, the the last thing I'll just sort of quickly flag is this whole other suite of competitiveness technology uh, issues that Otaviano referenced, where you know in my mind it comes down to two things: regulatory certainty and regulatory alignment. Right? You know, if you are uh, trying to create a bespoke system of regulation in whatever area, you know, uh, but technology is particularly important because there has to be interoperability here. I mean, there, there, it is not going to work if these systems are trying to be created exogenously. So you, you do need a common set of standards they need to align. And, by, and frankly, this is one of the things I'm most concerned about in the developed country model that we're seeing US and Europe, for instance, increasingly fray. So so anyway, alignment, I think, is one key thing, whether it's on, you know, uh, product standards, uh, competition policy, tax policy, we need alignment, and then we need certainty. We need to know, the private sector needs to understand that if it invests today, the world is not going to turn upside down and change tomorrow. And and that is also, in recent years, something that we've concern, been concerned to see the lack of stability in many places in technology policy. So I'll stop there. Okay, Ottaviano, what's the role and responsibility of policymakers given sort of this landscape that we've just been discussing? Particularly to leave the space for the creativity uh, of uh, uh, investments and, and search for opportunities and, and experiment and allow for, for ex experimenting. Uh, let me tell you uh, uh, an example. Let me give you then an example of a very successful experience that I have accompanied, sponsored by, by the World Bank, which has been uh, the use of a distributed ledger technology, blockchain, connecting uh, producers of avocado and mango in Haiti that have been connected to consumers in the United States and Canada through uh, a DLT uh, equipped broker. Interestingly, the spoilage rates fell. The elimination of uh, middleman uh, resellers uh, also uh, was, was, was there. And just to give an idea, uh, while the uh, merchandise was tracked across the value chain, the farmer's income in Haiti increased eightfold. Eightfold. That is to say, the use of DLT tracking not only provided confidence on both sides of the uh, of the equation, but also allowed for a, a stupendous increase in, in, in efficiency and, and less and less waste. So these uh, the role of policy has to be uh, particularly enabling one, one making possible that the, 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 ex, the, the uh, search for these opportunities for getting efficiency and, 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 and uh, improvement uh, in the, in the uh, access to markets and to technology by the poor uh, has to be found, has to be allowed for. Cherise, what's the role of policymakers in this conversation? 
me, I think uh, as a startup, a tech startup working in, in Africa and, um, you know, South Africa being one of the leaders on the continent in terms of the, the, the tech, the, the landscape, um, I, I still, I, I still, we still have numerous challenges around driving what we do. Um, even though we've been, we, we win international awards and we've, we've been doing some really cool things and some really great things with proven, proven international partners with these great track records. Um, but essentially um, pushing it, if we, I mean, if we had to push what we are doing and continue to drive it on our own uh, and just have the technology speak for itself purely without um, any international support as we currently have, it would be trying. Um, so there's things like reducing the red tape around getting involved in procurement strategies and things like that. It's, it's certainly not simple. And I, I think it would require a lot of empowerment and a lot of engagement from, um, from the private sector with, with public sector for, for national government and decision makers and policy makers to truly understand the impacts that um, various innovations can immediately have um, and, and perhaps start understanding and figuring out ways to better implement those kinds of strategies so that they understand and they see a short-term benefit, a medium-term benefit, and ideally where you want to go, where you want to see the technology take these communities and peoples in your country um, in, in a few years. And all of those things are possible because, as always, emerging economies lag behind and our policies are often outdated as, the, as our procurement policies currently are. So it, it's not like we can't see what's happening and we can't see the benefits of the use of so many technologies around the world. It's happening elsewhere and there's obvious economic benefit to it. So I think these things are possible. So things like reducing the red tape, um, improving access to finance um, for, for tech startups and, in, and companies using innovation in various ways. And I think um, the panelists are right, having leaving space for creativity and actually providing an enabling environment um, yeah, to be able to, to foster that kind of innovation would be a massive, a massive help. All right, this is great. I've got two questions from the audience. My friend, Bonnie Glick, who's the former deputy USAID administrator. She's also a senior advisor at CSIS, and she was the author of USAID's new digital strategy, which uh, was launched here about uh, a year ago. Emerging markets are front and center in the middle of the competition between the US and China, specifically in technology. Can we compartmentalize our tech engagement with emerging market countries while separating them from China? And how do we protect data of countries and citizens of those countries, particularly across the massive global supply chains and across new financial technology? So that's one question. Then there's uh, Jenny from Washington, DC. The US intelligence community yesterday issues reports on global trends and including among its primary themes, the fragmentation of society and the global order and increased contestation within community states and the international community. Can, can you speak to how digital technologies can be helpful in mitigating these threats? I should be offering digital hard drinks as a result. That study was pretty, pretty, you know, pretty, it was a pretty sobering um, study. Anyway, so you don't have to answer both those questions, but you could pick one. So again, one is about the issue of, of um, US, China and emerging markets and technology. And the other is the global trends and some of the, some of the challenges that we face and can, speaking to how digital technologies can help in mitigating these threats as opposed to <laughs> exacerbating these threats. So why don't I start with you, Ottaviano, and you could pick one and then I'll let each of you, yeah, Sharice and Karan, Karan think about how they wanna answer it. Ottaviano? Yes, sure. Uh, uh, you, oh, the, the question highlights uh, one one of the challenges faced uh, by major markets and development co uh, economies, which is exactly how to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the U.S.-China rivalry with respect to technology, and that's uh, you know I I like to refer to to the Prime Minister of uh, Singapore, Singapore, a tiny small uh, country who uh, said that don't expect us to align automatically with any of these uh, major powers. We want them to compete for us. We want them to, to, to do their best to, to engage us, uh, which is not something, as, as we know, uh, easy. The, uh, but the point that I want to make is that 
this competition, which is legitimate, it's, it's uh, well, U.S. And, and China will be uh, competing on uh, on the primacy with respect to 5G and and and, and next, uh, but uh, you know, from the standpoint of developing countries, they have to search for uh, maximizing their fruits by by allowing the competition to take place. So no alignment, no automatic alignment is, is fruitful. Uh, uh, that's something, for instance, that uh, 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 now it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna take place in the competition for uh, the, the auction for a 5G, for instance, in a country like Brazil. Uh, you cannot simply impede the Chinese or 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 any other uh, from the standpoint of the interest of the countries that, that let the competition to to take place. Uh, that's first and foremost the the uh, the thing to be done by from the standpoint of the emerging market in a developing country. Okay, Cherise. I'm here, Dan, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, yes, please go ahead. So I've been, I've been thinking about this and I'm in agreement. I think it's important just not to automatically align yourself into other international policies. However, I think emerging, emerging, emerging countries do, do have a responsibility, I think, to their citizens to look at the rest, look at the leaders in the rest of the world and make and take a start there in with the process of increasing adoption of the of, of the technologies in their home countries. So I, I would say, I would say to to look to the leaders of of those technologies and to to follow their lead initially to see where the technology can really take you and to cultivate relationships with the private with the private sector and the local innovators in in the space to to see what else what else can be done. Karan? Uh, so I, I, I actually, let me try and combine a little bit of a response to both questions. I think uh, in response to Bonnie is, I, I don't, I, I agree that the security challenges are growing. Um, some of these are sort of state to state kinds of issues where you, your focus really needs to be on, on sort of broad network security. Some of it is, you know, honestly, day-to-day -day security is, is, the, is the focus on security with re security and privacy with respect to to individuals' data. I think, I do think that there are policies, there are things that can be done by the private sector, by the government, to try to do a better job of addressing this space. But the era that we are in is one where security challenges, unfortunately, are going to exist and. And so you need to, you know, I mean, uh, things like hybrid cloud environments are smart things to be doing to mitigate risk and so forth. So I, anyway, I think that that is a space that bears continued focus. To tie it a little bit into the second part, uh, what I am worried about to some extent, though, is that uh, sometimes concerns about security or concerns about sovereignty, which are legitimate concerns, can spill over into what are fundamentally protectionist policies. And that yields fragmentation of not just the trading system, but the internet writ large. And I do worry that we are seeing this incredible tool that has generated so much benefit to the world, to global economy and so forth, look at uh, sort of a, a, a breakdown of international norms and with it, the, the services that and benefits that are provided. So uh, we need to be watchful uh, for that. It is, it is a concern and a risk. All right, I think we should leave it there. Uh, this has been great. I wanna thank all of the panelists for being with us today. This was tremendous. I'm really grateful. Thank you, Sharice. Thank you, Ottaviano. Thank you, Karan. It's excellent. I hope everyone stays safe. Everyone go get your shots and Hope to I hope to get to Cape Town at some point in, in at the by the end of 2021 and, and so uh, and I hope to get out and travel overseas and I'm sure all of you want to do the same thing so stay healthy and stay safe everybody thanks bye. Thanks.